right. Yeah. Didn't they used to put like shellac or varnish no, also? He did because they're very shiny. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, they used to put So I therefore not only got a nice art education, but I got a 
plaster roll that is used for quick setting arm fractures or leg fractures. And I will. The plaster came in rolls and it was gauze infiltrated with plaster, pieces ah. of plaster. We proceeded to experiment with it, with these rolls. Um, you, you take, you cut off a piece of the uh, roll and dip it in warm water and place it on elbow, a chin, a face, a hand, a wrist, whatever you want to do. George had started just a little bit before that, and he was working with burlap and plaster. Okay. But his figures were very heavy, and he just was not happy with that medium. He was looking for something, something lighter. lighter. <laughs> and these rolls came around and were being manufactured by Johnson & Johnson. And we all were experimenting and playing with it. And you know, we took our little projects home. George took the rest of all the rolls home. And his wife, Helen, decided with George that she would cast him. So she did. Was she an artist too? No, oh. she was a supporter of the artist, okay. uh, you know, helping him along. But what happened was she put all this, these plastic roll, gauze rolls on him. George was very, very hairy. all over his body. At that time, we didn't know about Vaseline, which should be applied first. So I remember George telling the story after this was completed. He said it was the most painful thing that he has ever experienced in his life, because every hair from his body had to be cut by hand to release the plaster. And you know, they were cut in sections. After that, he became very familiar with Vaseline, as we all did. Did he ever pass to you? <coughs> no, I offered many times, <laughs> but he always had very young, beautiful bodies to work with, <laughs> or older ones. Every time I go to a museum, there's always something in gorgeous. So it just makes me feel wonderful. Oh, yeah. and you were right there. Honored to have him as a teacher. That length of time. <laughs> and even later on, when I would meet him at a movie or the grocery store or something like that, he always said, Oh, Ellen, what are you doing now? And I would tell him, He says, Do you have any pictures? And I sometimes said, Oh, that's good. You know, he always encouraged me and other students as well. My compositions always go back to what George said. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a nice thing to know why I've accumulated some of those skills to continue my art. Do you, when you design something, do you write it down, make a sketch? Sometimes I do. Um, sometimes I just play with the forms and move them until uh, I get a comfortable, appealing composition. Mm -hmm. um, many years ago, had a friend who was a writer for the New York Post and the New York Star Ledger. Uh, his name was Alfred Aronowitz. And he was, uh, his job to write was to interview brand new people in the entertainment world, mostly singers or instrumentalists. And we were at his house this one day in winter, and this he said, hey, come on in. I want you to meet my friend. And his name is Bob. And I said, OK. And he yells out, hey, Bobby, come on in. And it was Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan said, hey, you know, gruffy, skinny, bearded, you know, just the way he looks almost today, I guess, only a little older, uh, younger at that time. So he says, hey, you know, I just finished this song. Would you like to hear it? And he said, sure. And he plays Blowing in the Wind. <laughs> For the first time. For the very first time. He was probably 
like back. 70 years old. For this so old rebel band that won't win the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. He called me and said, I liked it. He says, but Ellen, he said, what happened to your 3D sculpture? Because all of these pieces are flat, except the vessels. And he said to me exactly what I have been feeling for the last month or two. And I am now in the process. My head is spinning all the time. Um, to make glass in a sculptural way. So I was in the basement yesterday, and I found two clay molds that I had made. <coughs> and now I'm ready to try to make glass sculpture in 3D. And I, I, I'm, very, I'm not exactly a you know, staunch feminist, but I certainly am very concerned with women's rights and politics and education and health and all the other things. But I felt that was my best statement I could make. I mean, not that I'm an artistic snob, but there's no concern about how a piece is finished. Uh, it's drippy, which I can accept sometimes, but not the whole thing drippy. There's no contrast. And it just seems haphazard, uh, unthought through, um, and very disappointing. Rudy said, because he left after Rutgers didn't brief, you know, they were cutting back on classes. And Rudy said, we really have to wait until the next ism comes along. Is that going to happen? Well, we're still waiting because, you know, it's bovism uh, and it's uh, impressionism. But it was, a, it was a period in the art field or in the art world that was recognizable. I don't know what's recognizable in yeah. today. Yeah. And when you see some of these... It's harder for artists today, I think. Oh, I'm sure it's it is. very hard. So what advice would you have for younger artists? Like, if you had to... What would you... Make sure you have another career on the side. <laughs>
whatever I did in the modern school was okay because I was doing what I was supposed to do. And so that always bothered me as I grew older to realize what was going on with me. And I didn't paint, I didn't do anything but be a sailor. Until I got, I got, I got discharged. And for about the first six months, my buddies and I, we were all discharged. So we had nothing to do, so we were like bar hopping. Okay. And I remember, like, this has happened the other day. I'm coming, I'm driving home, drunk as a woman. <laughs> and I said, why am I doing this? I'll go home, I'll fall asleep, I'll get up around 12 o'clock, and I'll fool around for a little while, 7 o'clock, we'll all get together in the bar. So you needed structure, you're saying something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I took the GI Bill and I went to the, the Art Students League. You asked what, what kind of painting I wanted to do. Yes. Well, in those days, I wanted to either paint like Rembrandt or, or, or Norman Rockwell. I was satisfied with either one of them. I was walking on someone or whatever down 57th Street, and I stopped and I saw a sign that said, Gallery. He said, Well, I went to the gallery and I was shocked. Brackman. Anybody ever hear of Brackman? Yeah. He was amazing. And I said, okay, this is something different. And so I, I broke away using him as an okay. influence kind of. German, right? I studied with uh, Steinberg, who was a lousy painter, but he was a good teacher. He would show up once a week and make the rounds. And, and he came to me and he looked at mine and said, keep painting. So I followed him around. Of course, if I couldn't get anything from him for my work, I wanted to see what he said to other people, and I learned a lot. Oh, okay. You had uh, Will Barnett, too? Okay, yeah. What kind of, what did you pick up from Will Barnett? Any, any influences from him? Well, it was hard work because it used a little piece of that big and scraping it there. Mm -hmm. So, I, in a sense, I learned a lot. I can't tell you what it was and how it trapped me. How it trapped me was known for having designed, designed the three rings for what year was it? Valentine. Oh, okay. It's like 19. What year was that? Well, I was in the league at the... 47? 47. Oh, yeah. So he designed it for us. Okay. And it was, I kept asking myself, why did he do three rings? I had the slightest idea. And one day, sitting at a bar with a glass of beer, I put my glass of beer down, and then I picked it up, and I put it down again, and I picked it up, and there were the three rings. Well, if it wasn't from Brackman, Brackman, I would still be trying to paint like uh, uh, Norman you know, another <coughs> a teacher. There was a teacher in the next studio who had a lot of students because he painted realistic. Right. And it was right next to mine. So I walked in one day. And I'm looking down here, and I see people starting a painting. And then I looked over here, and they were a little further on. And then I looked over here, and I found to a finished painting. And I said, he's got it all worked out. First you put this color down, then you put that color down. And you end up like these guys that are here. No, that's not for me. Uh, so you wanted more of a spontaneous kind of way of painting? Yeah, well, when I saw Brackman, a German painter, 
I said, okay, this is something different. This is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember what I began to paint. But eventually, I got to, to figure. And I got to female figure. And I said, this is good. And I did a lot of female figure. And all of it, if you look, all of my paintings are from way back. Many, I have not done a female figure painting in many, many, many years. But then I found a different way of painting. And that was, uh, I just put in color down and see what happens. This is how I'm painting now. So you're not using any form? Or? No. Okay. No, I'll just slap painting. What, what is it about the female figure paintings that treat you? So I've got a little older. Okay. Tell us about your sense of color and uh, composition. Well, there are a couple of things. I like my work to tie up somehow. I like this part to be related to that part, this part, to be that part. And when I am painting now, I haven't the slightest idea what I'm going to end up with. And I just slap colors and things. I don't care what I can do with that. I, don't, I keep looking at it, or I go away, and then I come back and said, oh, okay, this is going to be the way to do And once I've done that, I don't know what the hell to do. So I go away and then I come back and say, oh, yeah, I see it. Got to go like this. And, and that's the only way I can get it done because trying to figure it out while I'm thinking, it's not going to happen. So it almost figures itself out. It figures itself out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, a little yeah. help. Mm -hmm. A little help from you. <laughs> <laughs> what other experiences in your life have affected your, your Women. work? Women. Well, okay. Women, okay. I was doing a seminar on something else, and one of the members of the female asked me to do project with her. She wanted to do something about breast cancer. So we should do it. And I said, okay, you, you help me with um, getting models. So we got, oh, her mother died at age 42. And she wanted 42 sculptures. We ended up with 47 because the women just wanted to have the time. Women that had breast cancer. Okay. So I did 47 of them. And it was on the plaster? Yes. Okay. Came away. It was very well received. As a matter of fact, a lot of the women who had breast cancer that I worked on were so happy to have that done. They were just a relief sometimes. How did you get the women to, um, you know, act as models? How did you? How did you get once get they once they heard about it, they came wanting wow. to have it done. So we failed in the sense that we couldn't get any of these breast cancer organizations to do anything for mm -hmm. us. And we did have a number of shows in various places in New Jersey. U N D N J. Oh yes. Okay. They asked us to have a, a, a show there. They had big uh, display yeah. cases ready to do. So we brought all that we had up there. And we all 47? All 47 of them? Yes. Okay. We, we used a couple of these uh, showcases. Uh, that sounds like very... Uh, it was very, very exciting. Yeah, very exciting. There, there was no section of the thing. No. I just did it because I was interested in the, 
in what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And the women really benefit by it. And I don't know what, how they benefit. Uh, well, but I, they were very, very happy. It was, it's, it's sort of like, you know, when you have breast cancer, you feel like, you know, you're getting, uh, you know, hurt in some way. Yeah, well, you, so you it's, no it's a validation that, that yeah. this thing has happened to you. And I think yeah. One of the things about I would, I would do the whole thing, and then if the breast cancer was on the right side or the left side, we had to decorate it in, in some way. And we asked each one, what would you put in place of the... In place of the breast. Yeah, I remember one woman said, flowers, the flowers that my husband loved. And another one said, uh, I want a butterfly or whatever it was. But the one that I liked the best was, uh, she was under construction. She was having it reconstructed. So I made a little platform and I bought some little toys, a little truck and some workers with a, uh, I put a little sign under the construction. <laughs> Yes. The first piece we had, had about three of them in the touching, in a store that sold things for pregnant women, for uh, women who had breast cancer. And so we put three of them, all of them, in the window. Mm -hmm. The next thing we hear, mm -hmm. a woman went by with her young child, I don't know how young the child was, and she did, reported it to the police department. <laughs> because, you know, her little son got very upset. Mm -hmm. And it got to the mayor. And this is in the Tachin? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the mayor said, well, if it's art, it should be in a museum. <laughs> and somehow or other, Channel 2, Channel 4, and Channel 7 got a hold of it, and they came down with their big trucks and interviewed us. And, uh, Nothing ever became of it, but it was nice to be on TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, talk about when you were in World War II and how that affected, you know, your life and your work. I was glad I wasn't a soldier. Besides, I looked better in the Navy. Okay. <laughs> but I enjoyed it in a way. My battle station was being a 20 millimeter machine gun shooter. And you couldn't have driven me any better because I had a machine gun. And I was captain of that crew. And there were three guys helping me passing the ammunition. And you know, here I am, 18 years old, and they gave me a machine gun. Because I could only take it home. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I like what I was doing there. But uh, I really wanted to come home. So I probably did work for all the major uh, advertising agencies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, did that influence your, your artwork, like your fine artwork that you did? Working uh, or one day, One or day I'm working on a piece, I don't know whether for an advertisement or point of purchase sign. But I suddenly said, I'm doing what I was taught to do. It all came back, but not consciously. One day I just looked at it and said, Oh, I learned that. And I was always very upset because I was as good as most of them. And I never made the money they made. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why. And I finally figured it out. Nice guy. <laughs> I did not know how to handle myself in public or in, especially in business. And that goes back to your, your um, 
you're growing up in the school Absolutely. because you feel you didn't have enough. It took me a long time to be able to get into a conversation just from nowhere. Okay. Uh, with people. Yeah. Who are some of your favorite artists? Uh, Yeah. And I looked through it and I thought, and it's good as they are, if not better. 